I'm joined today by Sean Murphy, who's going to talk with me about two very exciting uh, programs we have coming up. Uh, the first program that Sean and I are going to talk about uh, is all about Irish women and the role that women have played in Irish society over the ages. Sean, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a real pleasure to work again with you. We've had a couple of great programs already uh, in these really unsettling times, and I'm really excited to be working together again for these. So yeah. Well, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm looking forward to doing these. Uh, these couple keeps my brain ticking over, and uh, every time I go through them, it's it's wonderful to you know to be able to recognise uh, your history and to give recognition to the people who came before you, and to uh, help other people to understand uh, our long and varied uh, and exciting history. Well, it is quite a history, and I uh, I think both of these uh, stories have got, you know, the, the story of Ireland it has so many lessons that resonate, you know, over the ages and can be especially meaningful for us as we're living today. You know, I think a lot of times when history is taught right, it gives us so many lessons to help us learn, you know, how to live today. And, and the first program we're going to do is all about Irish women and the role, uh, you know, the, the rights and role that women have played in Irish society over the ages. Um, which I found quite fascinating. I was not, uh, you know, I had some inkling, but until I was reading even some of the description, I'm really excited about your course because it, it, it became very clear that women once held a very high role for many, many, you know, hundreds of years, it seems, uh, in Ireland. So uh, right. tell us a little bit. How did you, um, how did you first discover that, uh, the, the strong role that women had had in Irish history? Okay. Well, I mean, it was a it was a strong role that women had for thousands of years, not hundreds of years. Um, we we know very little, uh, you know, about uh, about the role of women up to about five or you know, around five thousand years ago. Um, before that, there were people. There were people in Ireland after the last ice age, which goes back about twelve twelve thousand years ago. Um, but um, five six thousand years ago, uh, the, the first case we have and it demonstrates the legal powers that women had um, and uh, that would be my starting point on the course because this demonstrates that uh, and, and also uh, it was one in which the uh, the judges at, at the time uh, decided in favor of a woman and it was a case she took against her husband who was the king of Ireland uh, who had uh, killed her dog in a fit of rage jealous rage uh, and, and she won uh, she won that uh, there's Ireland's always referred to uh, in the feminine. It's always referred to as a woman, and uh, most of the names for Ireland uh, refer to women queens. Uh, you know, there's Scotia, which is the origin of Scotland, in fact, and people from Ireland for a long time, even in the time of Julius Caesar, were called Scoties, um, reputedly after Scotia. And then there was Fan, uh, there was Fola, Bamba, and um, Fola, Bamba, and an, another woman. Uh, they were three names for Ireland, uh, you know, originally. Uh, and again, they were all women. The only one that was uh, male was uh, a, a son of the King of Miles, of uh, King Miles, who was the last of the Celtic invaders to Ireland, and his name was Ear. You know, so Ireland. Ear land, the land of Ear. Uh, Era, which is the Irish name, uh, is the other one. I said Fanban and Fola, the other one was Eru. So she's the one that Aaron comes from and uh, Era, which was which is the Irish word for uh, for Ireland. And then we have, uh, probably everyone's heard of Queen Maeve, um, Bridget, and the connection between Bridget and the goddess Bridget uh, is, is important. Um, and also the... Uh, the in the formal uh, when it when the, when the monarch of Ireland because we had a monarchy in Ireland for a long time uh, and when the monarch got married sorry uh, was was uh, was was uh, was enthroned uh, it was seen in all Irish history as the marriage and he was getting married to the goddess of sovereignty uh, and again that was personified by a woman and one of the reasons why women weren't sole monarchs or the women could be queens of provinces and queens you know and, and head of their clans but they couldn't be the monarch of ireland and the reason was because uh, 
uh, same-sex marriage was not recognized. There were 10 types of unions recognized in ancient Ireland. Three of them were, if you like, formal marriages, and the other seven were different types of unions. But they were all recognized because within all of those unions, there were rights, responsibilities, and things that had to be you know, clarified for the purposes of society and the law. Uh, but none of those included same-sex marriage. So it didn't make sense in old Irish society then for a man to marry a woman in the sense that he was marrying the goddess of sovereignty. So that's one explanation that we have for why. And in fact, there was only one. There was one, one queen monarch of Ireland, uh, and she had to take it to the battlefield uh, to essentially assert her rights. She claimed that she uh, had, had the right to be the, uh, the monarch of Ireland because when her father died, he had no sons. So it's often a claim. And within all our Gaelic society, if uh, there were traditions around what happens, if uh, the uh, parent, the father dies or the man dies without a male heir, uh, usually his property went to his daughters. Now, when they died, the property had to come back to the clan because in, in ancient Ireland, the property couldn't be alienated is what the word they used. So it couldn't end up in the hands of a different clan. But anyway, that's... So, the, so there's obviously quite a rich history, which I'm really excited. And there's a lot that you obviously know and, and, and will learn about. But I also understand that things radically changed in Ireland when Christianity came in, uh, it was, was forced upon. And that really radically changed the role that women were allowed to play in society. That's right. The, uh, so a lot of the rights that women had uh, were changed. And in fact, even the laws, because when the laws were written down for the first time, it was written down during the time of St. Patrick. Uh, and anything that did not uh, gel with Christianity was kind of left aside. And unfortunately, we don't have the side notes of those meetings, so we don't actually know a lot about. Uh, we, we know there was a continuity in, in lots of areas, but we don't know the pieces that were, were ditched. All we do know is that the old laws of Ireland were Christianized. And we take St. Bridget, <clears throat> you know, again, there were, there were issues because even in, in, in the kind of transition period, it was getting more difficult for women, you know, to be leaders within their society. And it was a, a nephew of St. Patrick who essentially gave St. Bridget her start. Uh, and, and, and Bridget was a slave to begin with. And her mother was a slave. Her mother came from Portugal. Um, had she, she had been brought, you know, to, to, to Ireland as a slave. So, uh, but you could in, in, in Ireland, it wasn't like a case system in India. You could work yourself up to, you know, from a slave up to the top, literally. Or you could work yourself down. You could end up being a slave. If you can't get to the point where you couldn't pay your debts or you committed a crime and no one forgave you, if you like, you ended up uh, back there. But she, uh, she relied upon a, a man. So she, she, she managed to, to, to make her, uh, you know, her stay. Now, the, the next big change then came when England came to Ireland because English common law made women the property of their husbands. And that was totally different. And it wasn't just you that were the property, your kids were their property. Uh, under ancient society, when you went into a marriage, whatever you brought in, you kept and you had a right to it during your marriage and you had a right to it when you left because there was a divorce. But under English law, everything that you had once you came into the marriage was your husband's, including, as I said, your, your children. And if you left, you left without any of them. You left without your kids. I mean, that, that was her. her That's yeah, what a what a terrifying, what a what a radical transition. Yeah. And then we know that during the, the the fight for independence, women were some of the very were serious leaders. Um, right. And that there's a great credit for the reclamation of women's rights because of that. The inspiration, both from the ancient history and from the more recent freedom fighters. Um, that's, right. that's right. Women participated in uh, you know the rebellions uh, uh, from as far back as 1798, and um, the uh, and just going back a little bit further, Grace O'Malley often talked about as Grand New Whale, uh, who was known as the Pirate uh, Queen in the you know in the 15 in the late 1500s when Queen Elizabeth was around. Uh, she was recognised as a uh, leader of her clan. Um, and that's about as far as the recognition went. But then when we, when we got to the, uh, after the famine, there was a whole sea change uh, in Ireland. If it had never been clear, you know, to people, it became immediately clear 
that our, our, our problem is twofold. One is the fact that our country is owned by, by another country. And also that the people that they put into this country do not have our interests. So that was bad enough. But the problem after the famine was emigration. You know, the, uh, you know, the population, there was something like 3 million people left Ireland from the beginning of the famine up to 1920. You know, so the, the drain was destroying the country. Uh, also, uh, our, you know, our language was dying. Um, and then the second wave then, you know, came in the, 80, early, the early 1880s uh, when with the, with the changes that were brought in, you now had uh, the only people who could stay in Ireland really were the eldest son and the eldest daughter. So all the non-inheriting daughters and non-inheriting sons had to leave. So that was, a, a, you know, a huge, you know, uh, uh, you know, draw people out of the country, most of which came to America. And that was the common thing, because uh, most of the people who arrived in this country came as families. But, uh, you know, for a lot, a lot of the time from the 1850s onwards, it was just sole, you know, individuals, men and women, which again was unusual that single soul women, you know, would come. Uh, so by then, uh, people had begun to understand we need to do something. And the process was called de-anglicization. The idea was to, first of all, to, to recover some sense of dignity and respect for who we are as a people and uh, to get people to understand the deep heritage because the one thing that they understood that people need if they were going to deal with that situation was motivation and the motivation had to come from being the person that you were and from your connection with your past so they started to work so the cultural kind of revolution if you like that begun in the 1880s a lot of that was led by women uh, and in fact, in the land war, uh, which was in the 1870s, that was also, there was a, a two committees set up because it was clear that the England, England would use the coercion acts to arrest the male leadership. But the English were such that they had difficulty arresting women. So there was a shadow leadership set up that was made up of women that were put, up, put in place to take over when and if and really, it was a question of just when, because they did get arrested, the men got arrested. So they took over and led that. And the land war was the end of it, really, for, uh, for England, because the result of that was all of those landlords ended up being bailed out at the beginning of the 20th century. And the Irish land, which had been confiscated and taken uh, over the previous 700 years, was then returned to Irish uh, people. And women played a great role in that. In 1916, same thing, the, the, uh, the, the, the opening words you know, to the proclamation included women. And the commitment that was in it was to women and, and the children of the land. Then during the War of Independence, uh, women played a critical role as well. Uh, there, there was an ongoing debate because, uh, you know, within the women's movement because there were issues like, you know, uh, because suffrage was kind of uh, one of the main issues that women were fighting for at the time. So the issue for a lot of women is wh what's, which comes first? Does the fight for suffrage become uh, the main pr primary battle or is the fight for national independence? Do we need to get national independence before we can get suffrage? And then can we get both at the same time? You know, so there were people, unfortunately, women were split. And then, of course, in Ireland as well, because even though the country was still not uh, partitioned, the reality was women north and south of Ireland and women in Ireland and women in Britain were divided because of the national uh, questions. So that created some difficulties. Uh, but during the War of Independence, women did jobs that men couldn't do. You know, uh, women were able to get jobs in offices as uh, you know, clerical assistants and the rest and were able to effectively spy and get information that was very, very useful. Also, women could travel around the country, not, not, not disguised, but in ways that didn't arouse suspicion. So they could go school teachers, you know, into areas and gather lots of information. They could also bring food, you know, to uh, uh, soldier, uh, to, to, to Irish rebels who were up on the mountainside because they could basically be safe. They were stopped. You know, I'm bringing this food, you know, to some of the poor families up here. I see them every day in school and they're half starving. So all of this food is going to the Murphys up here and the Quinns up here or whatever. But in reality, they were bringing it. So there were lots of jobs like that that women uh, could do. The other issue was... It does women sound... Were, I, I'm going to interrupt you for just a sec because I think... Um, First, I want to encourage everybody to come. There's, there's so much fascinating detail here that it is, it's abundantly clear that not only have women had a very interesting history, um, they've been really integral to the, 
the development and I mean, of, of every society for sure. But this, there's going to be a lot. There's just so many awesome examples of what role women have played that have made Ireland what it is today. And what we're going to talk about in our second program is really celebrating the the culture, and I'm sure women have been a, a part of that celebration uh, woven through the tapestry as well. And I wonder if we can pivot a little bit um, and encourage people to to come to the second program as well. Um, and sure. And, sure. and I think you know we're, we're, when I'm taking one of the things that I'm taking with the, from what you've been saying so far is just a, a great appreciation for all the creative ways that people have figured out how to survive with these very challenging circumstances. Um, and that, that women have been integral to that. Um, and, but it's that, that ability to survive with, you know, you know, with, with, with England coming in with, you know, with Kings that are killing dogs with like, you know, there's just such over thousands yeah. of years and, and, but there's, there's a way that they did it without going crazy uh, and, and by persisting and, Tell me about it. You know, you were inspired, I think, to put this, this the, our second program that we're going to celebrate uh, this summer together because of that survival instinct and, and the beauty of how Ireland and its people sure. have survived. Yeah, and it also goes, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, I, Irish people are known as hospitable uh, and friendly, and uh, and a lot of people take that, uh, you know, for granted. But the, the reality is that it's rooted, you know, in our history. The old laws uh, and customs in, in ancient Ireland, uh, hospitality was one of the key features of that. And uh, it, it was structured. And even down to the basic level, you know, everybody had to be prepared to take uh, what was called a, a stranger, you know, into the house. You've got to knock on the door. You had to take them in, feed them, look after them, uh, have them entertained. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, promoting uh, the best, you know, of, of, of Ireland. So that was, that, the hospitality was a central feature and there were laws which governed it. Um, so the fact that Irish people continue that is connected to that distant past. Unfortunately, during the famine, that got broken for the first time because during the famine time, when people were dying and diseased, they had to turn people away. Uh, and also uh, what people used to do was... Uh, uh, you know, to indicate that you shouldn't come near them, they had to put, uh, there was a certain type of uh, bush that they had to put or, or some indication outside of the house, please, you know, please don't come here. But the tradition of that hospitality began to be broken at, at that stage. Uh, but still, you know, you know, people, Irish people dance and sing everywhere. So I put this together and it's a combination of history. So I'm trying to connect all of that to try to explain why people are what they are. I also want to show the art that people produced, particularly during the Bronze Age. The Bronze Age started in Ireland about you know, 2500 uh, BC, you know, 4,500 years ago. And uh, you can see, uh, uh, you know, that the artwork there is as good as the artwork that anybody could do today. Uh, it's brilliant. Uh, we also think uh, there are some people who argue that uh, King Solomon's gold came from Ireland because there was so much gold, you know, in Ireland at this at this time. And it's, uh, it's also possible that the Irish were involved about 1200 BC. Uh, there were mines uh, on, the, on the East Coast here, uh, copper mines that essentially were emptied uh, by people from Europe. Um, we think that maybe some of those may have originated from Ireland or Ireland was a staging post, you know, in that. So there's some amazing history there. But I'm going to give you some examples, particularly what's, what kids are doing today. Their dancing is just wonderful. Um, and there's a whole new uh, focus in terms of dancing. And uh, they're, they're creative. Uh, I'll be showing you how they use their dance to show off the countryside and the area. So for instance, you have kids dancing on mountain, mountain tops, you know, so that you can see the beautiful scenery. And also on the beaches, there's, uh, and, uh, you know, I have a little bit of comedy. The problem with comedy is that it's so hard to get a family comedian. Um, and it's very <laughs> hard to, uh, uh, to get any more than about 10 seconds of a comedian without something being said that's offensive. But I have Brendan Grace, who died last year, and he was, he's the kind of the main family comedian. So I've got some, some, some of his work. Uh, so I've got the, 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 the art, the songs, uh, the music, uh, the history to kind of tie it all together. And, uh, and you're going to be sharing a lot of, uh, I, I assume, a lot of video with this, in addition to stills of some of the, the ancient art 
That's right. So I, people I, can I, expect I, a very, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it'll be a very multimedia presentation. That's right. There won't be that much of me talking. Um, you know, there'll be uh, plenty, plenty of embedded uh, video. I'll also then, when I'm there, be letting you know about my ongoing courses. Uh, I teach um, uh, a, a course of general history that starts at the very beginning uh, in terms of Ireland, which is 1.7 billion years ago, and I bring that right up to the present day. I also do uh, a history of each county of Ireland, and then I'm working on some new material now as well. One of the ones I'd like to do in the next year or two is the history of the Irish and American. Well, I'm, I'm sure that would be a fascinating program that I would certainly love to learn more about. So, Sean, I am so grateful. You have such a great wealth of knowledge about Ireland and the Irish diaspora, really, uh, because it's a lot more than just the Emerald Isle. The, the people of Ireland have gone on to influence culture on a global scale um, and to inspire us, all of us, with whatever, wherever we all come from, we can all learn something from this history of uh, a really amazing place. So I appreciate you sharing your passion and your knowledge with us. Sure. Uh, I, can't, I really look forward to these programs and yeah. to more in the future. Thank you so because, much. Because one of the things that, uh, you know, would be very, very paralleled with here is the history of the native peoples of this country. Mm. Because obviously the, the European history in this country is only hundreds of years old. Uh, whereas, you know, if we're talking about five to 10 years, 10,000 years, you know, it's, it's really the native peoples of this country that sh- would share some and would understand, you know, some of the old and ancient history of Ireland more than Europeans. That makes total sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, well, I am looking forward to doing it. Great. I am as well. Thank you so much. Okay. I, I look Thanks forward to seeing you there. Okay. See you soon. Great.